So uh, the next talk will be uh, given by Associate Professor Gu from uh, NTU. So uh, uh, Professor uh, Gu was, did his PhD in the uh, uh, University of Queensland in Australia. Then he moved to Chihuahua University in Beijing for three years, uh, uh, from 2013 to 2016. And then he uh, joined us at NTU. Uh, so Professor Gu is a, a, a very uh, brilliant uh, young researcher working on uh, quantum for, uh, information, quantum for, uh, fundament, uh, artificial intelligence, and uh, complexity. And his, uh, the title of his talk today will be uh, Quantum Enhance uh, Autonomous uh, Agents Can Quantum Restoring uh, Better Adapt to Complex Reality. So please, uh, Miller, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here to celebrate Cian Yang's 100th year and to sort of uh, tell you a little bit about some of the interesting things that are going on here at NTU. So as mentioned, I'm sort of, uh, I'm sort of, uh, I am uh, currently at NTU, and I lead this group on sort of understanding how uh, physical interactions at a very small level can apply to interesting things at the scale of macroscopic systems. And so this is encapsulated by this group that we call the Quantum and Complexity Science Initiative. And at first, these two topics may seem to be quite disparate. And indeed, we have heard a lot of wonderful talks this morning about how we can sort of see in Young's advances have helped us understand how particles at the very fundamental level operate and sort of the rules and the mechanics that govern them. On the other hand, what I want to emphasize is that th these rules, even though they look like they only govern things at the fundamental atomic level, they also apply, and we can also use these ideas to help us understand things at the macroscopic level, so the complex environments, that by understanding these fundamental interactions, they can be leveraged to understand these complex environments around us. So the, the theme that sort of encapsulates these that I want to tell you about is the idea of autonomous agents. So here is an illustration of an agent behind me, which is really just my daughter, two-year-old daughter there. And you can sort of see as they grow up that they are really, they are these agents, they're trying to interact with that environment that they don't fully understand. They're trying to knock those blocks down, seeing what happens, and in the process, learn how their actions have reactions. And by doing that, build up a model of reality that can help them govern, navigate, and survive in the complex environment around us. And when we think about these agents, of course, the first thing that we come in mind are these biological entities. And indeed, we can model a lot of biological entities like these predator prey by these uh, reactive or interactive agents. And similarly, as technology advances, we're thinking of building these agents ourselves in these ideas of the Internet of Things, edge computing. We're trying to build autonomous machines that can navigate, that can survive, and adapt to various different environmental processes. And here is an illustration of course, autonomous vehicles is one of those things uh, that we can think of as one of these agents. But going, be uh, going beyond these sort of technological uh, applications, and the thought process of agents as something in mathematical modeling or computer science, one should realize that uh, agents have been firmly interconnected with the field of physics. And in fact, arguably, perhaps the first real quantitative treatment of agents came from the physics community, from these ideas of Maxwell's demons. And as we just heard from sort of Professor Ping's talk about these ideas of the second law of thermodynamics being fundamental, uh, turned one of the biggest puzzles that um, was first stated by Maxwell a long time ago was that it appeared that if we had an intelligent agent that could monitor whether gas molecules going through one of these two partitions behind me is either hot or cold, they can, he can kind of let the hot particles go in one side and the cold particles in the other in apparent violation of the second law of thermodynamics. You can somehow have something that's of the same statistical equilibrium but through our agent, make one side hotter and the other side colder. 
and it took a physical understanding of these agents and the physics of information processing for us to reconcile these ideas with the second law. And hopefully one of my colleagues, Nelly, will be talking about that a bit later. But it kind of illustrates that by understanding agents and by thinking about agents as physical quantities, we're able to unravel some of the paradoxes that plagued us uh, in, sort of a, in many sort of centuries ago. Now, in the more recent developments, these agents have become also prominent in our ideas of building the next generation of computers, these quantum computers. Because one of the biggest noise sources in quantum computing are these complex environments out there. We find that gates suffer noise, not just dependent on what's happening right at the present, but also depending on what has occurred in the past. In the sense that if we apply, look at the error models of a gate, the errors will be different depending on what gates we applied previously. And this sort of non-Markovian error uh, is one of the biggest challenges of building modern day quantum computers. And to be able to adaptively correct for these errors, we need to think about agents that can monitor the environment, understand it, and be able to do these appropriate corrections. Now, the usual computer science way of thinking about these agents is in a model as follows. We think about a complex environment that the agent is interacting at every time step, that, is, uh, uh, that the agent at every time step is sending out some sort of signal, a probe, or an action, and then receiving some sort of signal in response, a reaction. And the agent inside himself has some sort of internal memory and a policy, so that depending on what he has done, uh, what it has done in the past, decide, makes a decision on what it will do in the future. And so, that's the, sort of the standard computer science model. But if we go into thinking about these agents as physical systems, then we can think about them as really just an uh, entity out there, a machine, that is in continuous sequential interaction with its environment. And that policy, that the agent decides every time is just some sort of physical interactions environment. As mentioned that uh, one of the holy grails is to think about how these ideas of physics apply to the brain, as we touched on in the last talk. You can think about this as a very primitive model of intelligent entity, a physical model, interacting with the environment out there and trying to understand it. And being a physical entity, the only the key thing that I want to emphasize here is that that P symbol, that process, that policy, stays the same at every time step. And how the agent can adapt to the environment basically depends purely on that top arrow that's going across, which sort of corresponds to the agent's internal memory. So the agent interacts with the environment in the same way, but may react differently because he's in a different memory state. Just like we, if we hear that there's lunch when we're hungry, we're more likely to react differently when we're not. So by having an internal state, we can react differently to the environment. And this is how we can think about these physical machines. Now critically then, the key thing that makes these agents intelligent, adaptive, is their ability to record information about the past and store the relevant information in the present so that they can make the appropriate actions in the future. And uh, the illustration here, I'm not sure how many of you have seen the movie 21, about these uh, group of students from MIT that pranked various casinos by sort of remember card counting in a game of blackjack. And this is a very sort of a, a very immediate sort of example of how this memory helps. No, uh, the blackjack table is essentially a prototype of a complex environment. It is not Markovian because uh, what we observe right now doesn't tell us everything about what has happened in the past. There's a deck of cards there, and depending on what cards have shown up in the past, the probabilities of what cards will show up in the future changes. And so if we were an agent that can remember the relevant information, such as count the number of high cards, then we are better able to adapt our strategies of when to bet, uh, gamble or when to bet and sort of elevate our odds above that of the casino and hence get kicked out of the establishment. And so another simpler example, which uh, is a game of pawn. Now, actually, I have to admit, I'm too young to have ever played this on a TV, but hopefully some of you have uh, seen this game sort of in live action. But it's a, it's a very simple game, but it's, uh, it illustrates it. So for those of you unfamiliar with pawn, it's uh, one of the first commercial video games ever released. Uh, into the private home, and it basically involved two paddles, those horizontal lines there, and one had to hit a ball, and the balls just 
bouncing around diagonally across the screen. And, uh, and so this is a, a fairly simple environment, and it's simple enough for us to sort of have a very good conceptual understanding of what the resources needed for one of these agents. And what these agents can do is they can move that paddle either up or down. So does anyone want to take a guess on sort of how much memory such an agent would need to be able to play the game optimally? Does uh, anyone want a chance to guess? Uh, no, anyone? OK, so the way that this works is that we think about the agent as it's taking stimuli from the environment. And here it's taking stimuli the screen. Uh, so basically what you can see is the screen. The screen contains almost all information about this world, except one thing, which is the momentum of that ball. So it doesn't know which direction that ball is going when you just take a screenshot. So for the agent to respond optimally, the agent wants to track something about that momentum. And because it's a very simple reality, that ball can only move diagonally in these well, four diagonal directions, then in general, the most information the agent ever needs to track is two bits of information to store all four possibilities. But of course, in the simplest scenario where, you know, as long as the paddle can move as fast as a ball, then actually it turns out the agent only needs to store a single bit of information because he just needs to know whether the ball's moving up and down and just align the paddle in the same direction. So this kind of gives you the understanding of how sort of uh, having some of these memory benefits our ability to sort of react to these environments. And indeed, uh, this is an uh, area that uh, a lot of people are thinking about. So this is one of the archive papers, I think, uh, published by sort of affiliates of Facebook. And they've been thinking about sort of what is the minimal complexity for adapting to various environments. And one of the toy things they did was look at the complexity of uh, various Atari games. Sort of uh, we have here a sort of Centipede and Space Invaders and Pac-Man. And so that they've done an estimate on the right, a table on roughly how many bits of information is required for agent to play these games quite optimally. This is all numerical, so there's a lot of error. It wasn't really an analytical result, but you can sort of see that games like Asteroids take a lot of memory because they kind of have to track all those asteroids around and all their various momentums. And so it gives a rough understanding of sort of uh, what resources are needed for us to navigate uh, progressively more complex environments. Now, so far we've talked about really just about the side of these complex systems, but uh, what does that have to do with uh, fundamental physics? And uh, one of the interesting things here is that uh, as we understand physics of fundamental particles and understand sort of uh, how they operate, we have new ways of processing information. Traditional information processing use just classical bits, ones or zeros, but quantum mechanically we can have superpositions of ones and zeros. Instead of just remembering a state of the environment, we can remember a superposition of states. And, and the question here is, can that help us? Sort of, uh, will a quantum agent, a quantum machine, if you'd like to think of it, processing information quantum mechanically, storing the past information in quantum memory, be able to do fundamentally better than the optimal classical agent? And this is, uh, uh, to us, it's an interesting problem because it sort of gives us this different, uh, it gives us sort of a fundamentally different advantage for quantum systems in the ability to adapt to more complex systems using f less physical resources. And uh, one of the sort of reasons why we sort of think this can be true is that there has been quite a bit of work that uh, us and others have done on first on modeling stochastic processes. So these you can think about as agents, they're not trying to, uh, adapt to the process, but they're just trying to understand what's going to happen in the future. And it turns out that when you build sort of a, when you build machines that try to sort of model the future, the amount of information they need to store at the past can be fundamentally reduced if they use quantum information processing. So it turns out that classically, when you build one of these machines, it's always storing some information about the past that is actually not correlated to the future, and it feels rather wasteful. And whenever this happens, there's a way for that uh, uh, to build a quantum machine that can reduce the amount of wasted information. So kind of like uh, enhancement of sort of these classical machine learning methods on dimensional reduction, where you want to reduce what information, relevant information you store. Uh, and it turns out you can further enhance this quantum mechanically. And the question is, what can we use this for? And can we use this to build more adaptation? Well, the first thing is that these quantum machines 
are able to leverage their superpositions to generate superpositions of future possibilities. So instead of just sort of a, and this, uh, simulating one future at the same time, they can simulate all possible futures in quantum superposition. And once you do that, you can sort of uh, build up interference experiments, as we have done here, to kind of compare the sort of differences between two different futures, perhaps based on an action that was made in the present. And one can do this sort of with a potentially sort of a significant enhancement in computational speed than what we can do classically, because we can store sort of an exponentially large probability vector in sort of a linear number of qubits. Now, uh, now let's go back then to how these things can or may or may not be able to help us with interactive agents. And here I want to illustrate the potential with a very simple experiment. So imagine that uh, we're sort of taking inspiration of the movie Blade Runner. We have this interrogator who wants to interrogate whether someone is human. And this is a very simple test. It's a, the interrogator will only ask one of two possible questions. And uh, so the first question could be, do you like electric sheep? And the second could be, are you human? And we imagine that this, uh, a, the, that the interrogator is asking this in discrete time steps. He asks one of these two questions at each time step, of which there is well, yes or no answer. And to pass the test, the agent has to, if he's answered the same question twice, remain consistency and answer the same. But if he's asked one, uh, the first question one first and then question two second, his, his answer to the second question must be as random as possible. And if we think about this, if we were to try to build a classical machine that does this, then what we need to remember is both what question was asked before and what answer was given. So that's two bits of information. And we can kind of build a finite state machine, so one of these finite automatas, that is able to sort of uh, perform this task. But it requires us to recall two bits of information about the past. But now if we think more carefully, this question has actually been specially engineered for quantum computers. Because if we were to store that memory in a single spin, then like the stern gerlach experiment, if we were to measure the magnetic, uh, if we put that spin in a magnetic field and measure sort of the Z component, and then if we measure that Z component twice, the answer would always agree. But if we were to measure the Z component and then the X component, then the Heisenberg uncertainty principle would say that the second measurement would be completely random. And so if we were to repeatedly do this, so whenever we store, we store our agent, um, we give our agent one spin, a single spin as a quantum memory. Whenever we ask question one, we measure it in the z axis. Whenever we ask question two, we measure it in the x axis. Then we're able to perfectly replicate that sort of desired input output behavior. So here, so the memory states corresponding to each of the four classical probabilities becomes a state on the single spin. But because we're only using a single qubit, the, amount of, uh, the total amount of information that we actually need is, uh, is reduced by a factor of two from, uh, from the classical memory that is required. And, uh, and so this gives us an illustration, well, yes, uh, perhaps using quantum machines, we're able to do better. And so a lot of our recent work has been looking at these and thinking about sort of how to build these machines and just exactly what potential can these quantum agents have. And it turns out that this potential can be unbounded. So imagine that we have an environment where to be able to react to it perfectly depends on knowing some continuous parameter to as good precision as possible. So our optimal response choice depends critically on some continuous variable parameter. Now, if we wanted to do this uh, using a classical computer, we'd sort of store, we try to track this uh, continuous parameter to as much high precision as possible. So 32-bit precision, 64-bit, et cetera. And that would be how much memory that we'd need. The more precision we, we want our agent to be here uh, to have, the more memory we require. But quantum mechanically, what we can show is that there are certain conditions that once satisfied, then no matter what precision the, we want the quantum agent to act on, the memory required stays finite. So it scales slowly up and saturates at some fixed bound. And, uh, and there's a very simple illustrative example here. Uh, what we have is a stochastic clock and uh, a resettable stochastic clock. So you imagine a clock that sort of ticks uh, in, can, uh, in some, at uh, certain time intervals, if it ticks exactly, precisely at every how many seconds, then it's a perfect clock. 
but for a sort of a imperfect clock, there's some stochasticity to it. So it, uh, it ticks according to some stochastic distribution. And when we sort of replicate these clocks, it turns out that if you want a perfect clock, you need an infinite amount of memory because you need to track a lot of information. But then you can look at, OK, what's the memory requirement of these imperfect clocks where you're allowed to sort of let it run, or you can press a button and have it reset. So it's kind of a very simple agent. Two possible inputs, you let it run, or you let it reset, and then you, uh, you sort of like a stopwatch and get it to run again. And we look at the memory requirements there, then you can sort of see from that graph that uh, that the quant uh, sort of uh, one of these agents implemented on a quantum computer or quantum stochastic clock in this sense would use can use significantly less memory than their classical counterparts, and uh, and they were, and you can also show that these phenomena is pretty general in that uh, whenever sort of for most processes classically with these agents um, they waste some information and whenever you know, there's some information waste then we can do better quantum mechanically. For certain processes, that advantage is great. For others, it's not as much. But there's always some sort of advantage, generically. Now, I'm running out of time, so I will skip a bit about the next part on potential applications. But suffice to say, one of the things that we're currently interested in is applying these things to recognition of time stream data. So you imagine that you've got streaming data out there, and it could be sort of here represented by zeros and then some numbers. So the numbers could, for example, represent a word. And you want to recognize which word it is. So you imagine that you have an agent that's listening to a continuous audio stream, and it's trying to make out sort of what words they are. And uh, so it's kind of the streamlined classification problem. And we can find examples of these classification problems where, sort of, uh, where quantum agents can perform far better than optimal classical agents if there was a memory constraint. And these correspond to these sorts of non-Markovian classification problems where you have this word, right? And you have to listen to the entire word to know whether this word A or word B, because maybe the last 10 syllables, they sound exactly the same. So you have to track a lot of information. And it turns out that quantum mechanically, uh, there are instances where you need to track less information. So we find examples of these classification problems. Uh, I won't go into the details, but classically, they scale linearly with the complexity of the problem. Well, quantum mechanically, they can actually stay bounded. And, uh, and so, we, so far, we have sort of singular examples, but we're looking at more generic theorems and trying to understand when precisely these advantages occur. So as a rough summary, um, one of the interesting things, I think, is that when we study these properties of fundamental physics, often we think that uh, we're just looking at things, you know, at the level of photons, electrons, so, uh, and, uh, and that it is relevant only to the, these physics at the fundamental level, so they're relevant only to quantum physicists or particle physics. physicists. But in reality, by understanding fundamentally how we can process information, we kind of have new ways of solving complex problems. And in doing so, we can sort of also understand fundamentally what problems that may look very complex classically. So uh, what sort of environments that uh, for a classical entity is very hard to adapt to. But if that entity was able to harness a quantum information processor, the processes may look remarkably more simple. And in terms of sort of some of the interesting outlooks or some of the potential future things that uh, we are currently in the midst of exploring, is uh, which I think um, opens kind of a, a lot of uh, uh, sort of interesting future potential. One of them for is these ideas of sort of adapting these agents. So sort of, so far we've been constructing these by hand, but because these agents can uh, we can simulate these futures in quantum superposition, there may be better ways for sort of uh, comparing their relative performance. And, and therefore being able to find new ways of training these agents. So we're thinking of ways of leveraging these things to train them so that we can automate the process of building these uh, simplified quantum machines. And we're thinking about sort of adapting them to understanding complex temporal data. So currently, we have some collaborations, for example, with UOB Bank, looking at uh, uh, being able to use these machines for financial analytics. And as you know, Goldman Sachs recently 
had this uh, white paper out about the potential for quantum computing in finance. So it's, uh, there's a lot of interest currently in quantum information in finance, where there's a lot of temporal data involved. And this is one area that uh, there's a lot of exciting prospects, whether it is to predict financial data or to sort of detect whether there's a regime change between sort of a high-risk environment to a low-risk environment. Then uh, there is a link with thermodynamics, which I haven't had time to talk about but tells us about sort of um, uh, how we can sort of leverage the, the, uh, our understanding of these models to build machines that can sort of harness correlations in sort of uh, in time. So when we think about thermal equilibrium, we, begin th uh, we start off thinking about it as just temperature gradients. Whenever we have a temperature gradient, we can build a heat engine and get work out of it. But anything out of statistical equilibrium has free energy. So if you have data, or that's fluctuating, so some sort of pattern, that has free energy in itself. But we need a machine to be able to predict and model it, or an agent to be able to act on it adaptively to be able to extract that energy. And there may be uh, more efficient ways to do so quantum mechanically. And so I will end there to just give a final broad perspective to say that uh, in the end, quantum agents, uh, we're really beginning to understand. What I've talked about here is the advantage of having a quantum memory. But we can also think about the advantage of having quantum probes, like autonomous vehicle that shoots sort of LIDARs instead of radar. And sort of these ideas of quantum sensing, quantum illumination, gives an advantage whenever the agent's action is entangled with its own memory. And of course, ultimately, we can also have quantum mechanical environments, which we need when we start to think about sort of error correcting the latest generation of quantum computers where we, and we're presently sort of looking at these things, building up these modular circuit architectures where we're thinking about the interlocking circuit between our environment and our agent, and establishing some interesting ideas about what fundamentally quantum agents can and cannot do, such as generalizing the uncertainty principles, uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in time. And uh, I think I'm pretty much over time, so I will stop there, and uh, feel free to ask any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Millet, for this uh, very inspiring talk. So we have quite a few questions, actually, uh, on the Slido. And people are mainly concerned about application of uh, quantum information mm -hmm. and quantum uh, 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 computing. So let, let me write you one of a few questions. So how will our knowledge in quantum information theory and complex system be used to develop cutting-edge technology an ideal business model that may potentially dominate existing technology that such cooperation like uh, Microsoft, IBM are using today. Right. So I didn't catch all of it, but uh, paraphrasing, I understand the question to be: How can we use our knowledge sort of of these of quantum information and its uh, relation to complexity uh, to sort of uh, solve industrial problems, leveraging sort of the technologies of today? Is that a rough, uh, correct paraphrasal? I, I, I think so. So we have uh, also similar question uh, regarding um, sustainability. So any idea how uh, quantum technology can help on, on that domain? Sustainability, OK. Uh, let me see if I can answer these in terms. So in terms of technology, um, I think we're living in a very exciting time. Because uh, for so when I started my PhD, quantum computing still seemed you know, decades away. It seemed a purely fundamental science field. And this was really only in the early 2000s. And in the last 15 years, um, we have seen a huge interest from sort of these places like IBM that are now marketing their own commercially accessible computers to the, the stage where you, know, you can now just create an account and start playing around with a remote computer to try these things out. And, uh, and indeed, these devices uh, uh, are already out there. And, uh, and, they, and so one of the biggest issues, I think, currently is that we don't know what these quantum devices can do. We have some ideas of what they can do, but it's kind of like classical computers in the 1950s, where we had a few applications we can think about in terms of cryptography or certain high, sort of uh, certain very laborious calculations. But now, you know, 50 years later, we see remarkable applications of classical computing everywhere, and it's very similar in the quantum field. And so. Uh, so what, uh, what my research here is to try to adapt sort of the, to look at the applications 
of these quantum computers in sort of understanding complex temporal data. And I think this is one of the applications that uh, I wouldn't say in the very near term, in the next five years, because the current generation of quantum computers still have a lot of error in that they can simulate for a couple of time steps, but then the coherence in them completely dissipates and one kind of gets garbage because we, uh, we our gates and stuff uh, currently um, uh, they don't have very high fidelity. But uh, it's something that I can foresee as one of the first type of applications that we don't need, we only need a fairly modest sized computer to be able to do sort of uh, meaningful simulations beyond what classical computers can do. The second question regarding sustainability. Um, so I guess there are two uh, things there. One is that, um, uh, that quantum computers, theoretically speaking, can use less energy than their classical counterparts. And, uh, and there's been several results that uh, of sort of the thermodynamic advantages of quantum information processing. Now, normally we think about computational advantages because um, uh, this seems to be the thing that people tend to care about the most. But, uh, but, we, but I think sort of uh, the thermodynamic advantages is something that is just as fundamental. And indeed, we see that currently with bitcoins and everything else, uh, the information processing actually does take a tremendous amount of energy. And theoretically speaking, quantum computers can be far more energy efficient. But I, I would say that this is purely theoretical at present because our, technolo our technology required to build these things often use far more energy than the computer itself. For example, if we were to cool something, uh, the, the, that, uh, that process itself uh, uh, the quantum computer computation may take not much energy, but you know the whole process of cooling it to almost absolute zero does take a lot of energy. So, um, uh, uh, so quantum has the potential to reduce it, but I don't think we're kind of technologically there yet in terms of thermodynamic efficiency. But there is future potential. The other is, of course, when we are looking at sustainability, there will be bound to be many computational problems that we want to solve, and these things quantum computers may be able to directly help by being able to solve these uh, computational problems that uh, classically is uh, intractable. Okay, thank you very much, Mine. So I think time is running. So let's thank again. Uh, ah, there is a question in the audience. Maybe we can take this question. Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Prof. Gu. I have a question regarding, uh, you said that any system that is out of statistical equilibrium, you have energy available that you mm. can take out. Yes. Could you share a bit more about what that means? Because I understand temperature gradients, and I think engines are easy to understand, mm. but I'm just wondering in general, what, what does it mean? And are there other examples that they? Yeah, that's a very good mm. question. So, so we started off with uh, traditional heat engines, which are just basically, uh, you, uh, we, we learn from sort of undergraduate physics that if everything is in thermal equilibrium, then we can't get any energy out of it. We can't do any meaningful work. And if we did, we would violate the second law of thermodynamics. <coughs> but if, uh, so this is to us the most disordered system. We have minimal knowledge about what's happening in that system. And when we have a temperature gradient, it really corresponds to that the entropy of the system is less than what it was before, the uncertainty, because there's some more structure in that system. We know that part of the system, the particles are bouncing quickly, the other part is bouncing slowly. And by leveraging that information, we're able to get energy out of it. And so one can actually recast the heat engine as an information engine. What, what we're really extracting from it is uh, the temperature gradient represents, uh, represents knowledge about the system. And by harnessing that knowledge, we're able to extract free energy. Now, once we get into sort of a non-equilibrium thermodynamics and uh, quantum thermodynamics, it turns out that this re remains true on the fundamental microscopic level, and that whenever you have correlations between different quantum particles, that and we have knowledge of what those correlations are, then it corresponds to us knowing something about the system. And it turns out that we can leverage that information to extract free energy at the cost of, uh, of sort of relaxing the system back to a statistical equilibrium where every particle is behaving exactly the same way. So whenever we have particles that are behaving differently and we know they're behaving differently, then we're able to extract energy. Now, a temporal data with pa a pattern such as something that is, for example, um, uh, up, down, up, down, up, down, then it's a very regular pattern. Once we know that regular pattern, we're able to leverage our knowledge to draw, uh, draw energy out of that. And uh, 
Um, so the quanta, it can actually be quantified by this thing called relative entropy, which uh, my colleague Nelly Ng will actually be talking about this afternoon. So I think if, uh, if you listen to that talk, you'll understand a bit more on the formalities of the formalism. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gu. So thank you. Great, thank you.